Our Bible study today is on Psalm 24, a Psalm of David, and uh, I'll offer a quick prayer. Lord, thank you for this uh, Psalm that David wrote long ago. It continues to speak to us through the words of the Holy Spirit. May we hear it and uh, acknowledge how Christ is the one who has ascended the throne. He is the son of David and the son of God. He is the one who has come to be our Messiah, our Savior, our Christ. Thank you for this gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as we, um, we're going to be finishing up on the Psalms because we're going to be changing our Bible study to Acts starting next week. But uh, this is another Psalm of David. And the collections of the Psalms of David, there's three main collections in the book of Psalms. And the early collection has a lot of the Psalms that we recognize as being uh, based on the historical events of David's life. So this psalm here is sometimes considered to be, um, you know, something that would be like a processional liturgy. It was used in the tabernacle before David's time in the temple during Solomon's time. And so you can see the, the words of this psalm often uh, fit with a lot of praise songs. In fact, we even say some of these words during the time of, you'll see like verse 7. Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, ye ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Um, that's something, liturgy in Christian churches uh, that we use during Advent. Right? So the Advent season begins with recognizing Jesus as the coming King. He came the first time to uh, suffer and to die, but he'll return the second time in glory. <clears throat> so that's why we use this during Advent. Uh, okay. Maybe we'd like to start over here with Dave. Okay. <clears throat> the earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Okay, so, you know, remember when we did Psalm 19, it talked about how all creation praises God? Now here it's acknowledging not only that creation praises God, but all creation belongs to God. Now, you know, we might say that's kind of obvious, <clears throat> but that's only obvious to the believer, isn't it? I mean, the unbeliever rejects the idea that there is any almighty power, you know. And so what is the, what's the idea that comes from uh, unbelievers about where everything came from in the world? I think it's the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory? I think it was spontaneous. Spontaneous? <laughs> yeah, evolution. Uh, you know, the idea of chance is how you could say that something that is so has so much uh, organization so much structure and I mean it it to say that chance is how the universe came into <coughs> being is like you know we've heard this before like uh, a junkyard assembling a 747 right you know it would never happen <clears throat> and yet you know there's more faith for an atheist in some ways than there is for a Christian to, I mean the evidence leads you know, if you're willing to accept the implications, I mean, atheists will accept some logical implications, but if those logical implications lead to a, to a designer, a creator, then that's where they draw the line. Because it's not about the logic, and it's not even about faith, it's about the rejection of God. And so, you know, for an atheist, a lot of times it's not uh, you know, no matter how much evidence you throw at them about, you know, look at how uh, creation shows us the existence of God. They already have assumed that God doesn't exist. And that assumption is their sin because it's the rejection of the creator. So for the believer, as David is led by the Holy Spirit, he says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So you can see the parallelism. It's very common in Hebrew poetry. So those two lines mirror each other. You know, he used the word earth and the word world are uh, parallel. Now, obviously, the word earth, we might think of, you know, the round globe, right? <clears throat> but the word earth in Hebrew is the word eretz, which is, can also be translated as land. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that when uh, a Jew talks about the land, what land are they talking about? Israel. Israel, the promised land. So the word Eretz is synonymous in Hebrew with 
Israel. So in, in essence, he's not just saying the earth is the Lord's, but he's, he's saying the land is the Lord's. And which land? The promised land. But then he throws in the word world, so we know that he's not just talking about Israel, the country, he's talking about the whole globe. Now, whether or not they knew that there was, the earth was a sphere is immaterial. The Bible doesn't contradict science, but it, doesn't, it also comes from a, an ancient worldview. And that ancient worldview observed things according to their senses. Right? And so, you know, it looks like the earth is flat when you're walking around. I mean, unless you're in a skyscraper like a mile high, you can't see the curvature of the earth. The only way that a lot of the, like the Greeks came to the conclusion that the earth was a globe was because they would see ships sailing across the horizon and you could still see the mast of the ship as the rest of it was going over the, beyond the curvature of the earth. <clears throat> so, you know, they deduced that the earth must be round. Right now, for David and people in the ancient world, whether or not they knew this or not is, you know, is not necessarily, the Bible doesn't come right out and say the earth is flat, but it does talk about the earth from the observation of, a, of just a person in the ancient world. You know, it talks about the dome of the sky, and it talks about, now it's using metaphors, and because in the book of Psalms, most of this is poetry, poetry doesn't mean that it is incorrect, it, it's just metaphors for helping us understand a, a bigger truth. So the bigger truth here, is, you know, is, has to do with, we're not talking about the workings of, of the globe, of the world, or, or and the word world here could also refer to the universe. It just talks about everything that's created. So it's making a statement of faith, right? So this is a statement of God's um, omniscience, uh, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, he is in control of everything, he knows everything, and everything belongs to him. Uh, so the only person who could say this is a person of faith, because through, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we acknowledge who God is. I look at this first verse all the way back to Adam and Eve. God created everything, and then he created Adam and Eve, and he turned the Garden of Eden and everything over to them. So, so I look at it as what he they were caretakers of the Garden of Eden. That's right. We're supposed to be caretakers of it, too. And I, I, I was reading the footnotes after that because the earth is the Lord's, all of us are stewards or caretakers. We should be committed to the proper management of this world and resources. But we are not to become devoted to anything created or act as sole proprietors because this world will pass away. You know. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, that, uh, the idea that acknowledging that God is the owner of everything also means that we are stewards of the things that we've been given. Yeah. You know, we don't own the stuff we have. So much of the time I see people, it's, it's like they become so devoted on objects in the, in the earth they put thought over man. It, it, it's, you know, you're, you're getting things backwards. That's right. Yeah, that definitely that's the backwards of, uh, thinking. You know, that's human human pride. Right. Marcus. Oh, it, it, uh, of course, the Bible is inerrant, and, and uh, we, we start with that. But uh, there are a couple of examples uh, historically uh, of great literature where there are scientific mistakes in it. For example, Shakespeare has a clock striking during Julius Caesar. Uh, there were no clocks at the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, Coleridge has a star in the circle of the moon. And of course, if the moon's dark, there's not, it's because you can't see the light in the moon, but there's still a moon there. So um, we don't devalue these things just because we don't quite understand how they did. <coughs> and it can be great literature. In the case of Bible, of course, it's it's great uh, doctrine as well as literature. That's right, yeah. Uh, so the Psalms are, are both poetry and uh, doctrinal. And so compared to, like, uh, like you said, um, that, that uh, play by Shakespeare about Julius Caesar with the anachronism, talking about you know, clocks in a time when they didn't have clocks. So the Bible doesn't have any uh, of those types of errors. It doesn't talk about things that didn't exist at the time that, they, that he's talking about, that the, that the writers are. You know, but sometimes atheists try to find those contradictions 
And so they're seeming contradictions. Like, for instance, when we looked at Psalm 19, where it talks about the, uh, the sun is like a, a runner who you know, gets ready to run his circuit. And so they say, well, see, it's, tell, it's telling us that the sun is circling, going on a circuit around the earth. And he says, that obviously is false. That's what atheists would say. And they say, we'll see, the Bible is false. But it's, you know, also the sun isn't, isn't a runner. So the whole point is it's, it's a metaphor in the first place. And to say that the sun doesn't follow a circuit, that it's stationary in the center of our solar system is also not incorrect because it does follow the circuit around the Milky Way and it takes tens of thousands of years to circle the Milky Way once, right? So it, it is on a circuit, it's just not circling Earth. And so, um, so it, we can see that uh, it doesn't explicitly contradict science but from an atheist point of view, they can definitely find things that they would claim are contradictory. Well, a lot of times, and I found out, which was helpful to me in our studies in the deacon classes, is that you need to study the culture and how they did things and understand how things were at that time because that's where the Bible is. Yeah, do the original that, audience. It's easy to misinterpret things if you just look at things the way we do things today, or how things are. Exactly. So, you know, that is actually one of the first rules of interpretation, is that you don't just look at the Bible as if it were written for 21st century uh, people in Western countries. So that, that's very, um, you know, it's an arrogant human perspective, that we believe that everything revolves around us, and everything is meaningful because of us. That's not true. It was written to an original audience, and of course, God's word speaks to people of all time, but if we don't understand who it was written to originally, how are we going to understand its original intent? And so, it, it, you know, you're not going to find anything in the Bible about computers because the people at the time, you know, I mean, Moses lived in 1500 BC, you know, 3,500 years ago. There were no computers. So for the Bible to talk about stuff that didn't exist would be crazy. We have to understand what did they understand and how did they understand it? And that helps us to apply it to our lives today. It's, it's like that one uh, uh, with the seven bridesmaids, but, you know, they, they didn't have enough oil and they ran out, so they missed out on the, on the bridegroom coming. You know, if, if you don't understand the, the culture at the time, you don't understand what they're talking about. Right. So. Well, I mean, there's actually a lot of things in the Bible that are start there you know they get beyond our customs right so the whole custom of marriage in the in the Jewish understanding is foreign to us I mean if you get engaged to somebody in the in the Hebrew culture in the ancient world you couldn't break the engagement without a divorce so uh, you know for us we would say well the marriage ceremony hasn't happened if you're uh, just engaged what's the big deal Right, but that's not the way the Jewish people understood it, you know. So that's why Mary and Joseph, Joseph had to divorce Mary, even though he had slept with her because they hadn't been married yet. But it claims that they were married because their engagement was the beginning of the marriage pact, and so it, we have to understand that. Okay. Back in those days, you didn't yeah. choose your own spouse; your spouse was chosen for you. Yeah, often it was. Yeah, but, um, well, I mean, in that perspective, we don't know the background of Mary and Joseph, but Joseph was definitely older because he died before Jesus uh, started his ministry. And so Mary was pretty young, so we're not too sure how that might have turned out. But yeah, there's a lot of things that we can understand better by studying. Uh, okay, verse 2, it, you can see that he continues the same theme about how the, uh, the world belongs to God. Bill, could you read verse 2? For he founded it up on the seas, and established it on the waters. Okay, so he's talking about the earth or the land, and then he was talking about the world. So then when it says he founded it, it's talking about land. So as, as you mentioned earlier, Van, this, doesn't this give us a picture of, of Genesis chapter 1, right? Yeah, so and when we look at Genesis 1, what does, uh, when does God create the land? Because at first, there's just the wor world that is made of water, right? So Genesis chapter 1, if you want to take a look at that. It talks about how God created the heavens and the earth, and there's darkness, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, so the waters 
represent not only you know the ocean, but it also represents the word for uh, waters in the Hebrew here is the word uh, or over the word deep, I guess, uh, is the word yam, which means sea. But it also was the name of the god of the Canaanites of the sea, kind of like Neptune for the Greeks and the Romans. So what do you think it means if God's spirit is is showing prominence or hovering over the what the Canaanites would have called the god of the sea, the deep? Well, it's, it seems strikes me that it's kind of like a nurturing uh, of bringing something into existence or birthing the creation by hovering above it like a somewhat more careful over it. Okay, that, that could be a, an, an image that uh, we associate with, you know, like a chicken hovering over its chicks. Uh, but here I think that the idea is that it's showing uh, superiority, that the Spirit of God is showing that, that he is in control of the waters, which for the Canaanites is like saying the God, the God of Israel is showing superiority over what they believed was the God of the sea, which is also the God of chaos. And so this isn't lost on the Hebrew people, that God is full of what ancient people thought was chaos. And even today, the sea is dangerous, you know, but most cultures have personified the sea as a god, like Neptune or, I don't know, was it, is there another name for Neptune? In uh, different cultures of Greek and Roman gods. And uh, Yam was the name of the god of the Canaanites. Uh, that's uh, verse 9 and 10, where you're talking about. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered waters he called the sea. And God saw that it was good. This is the third day. Okay, so yeah, on the first three days you have three separations. The separation of light and dark, the separation of the waters above and the waters below, which is the sky and the sea. And then the third day is the separation of the water from the dry ground or the land. And it even uses the word, verse 10, God called the dry ground land, or, and that's the word Eretz, which is the word that we're looking at in our text today. And so God is showing uh, that he is reclaiming the land from the Canaanite god of chaos. You know, the Bible is not acknowledging that the gods of these other cultures exist. But because it uses words that are the same as the names of these gods, it, it's kind of like in English, if I told you, you know, oh, you have the strength of Hercules, does that mean I believe that the like, gods have, you know, had children with humans? No, it, it's a metaphor. And so there, these are metaphors that the Bible is acknowledging in order to show the truth that God's in control. And so the God of Israel is the true God. These other nations believed in false gods, and the Bible is telling us that false gods like Yom is, has, is no match for the God of Israel. Not that Israel believed that Yom existed, but you know they were tempted to, to try to worship other gods. And so the Bible over and over again shows that the only true God is the God of Israel. So in verse 2 of Psalm 24, for he founded it on the seas. So God placed the land on the seas and he established it on the waters. And it's interesting that, that two-thirds of the earth is still water and this is what amazes me is that is that there are people who say oh the the flood in genesis 6 could never have happened well there is more water on earth than land and you know the only reason why you know they people say well how could the himalayas ever be covered with water because it says in genesis 6 that you know water covered the earth you know for like 40 feet above the very top of the the uh mountains first of all not not all the mountains were as high as they were back, you know, back then. They were sh smaller. And there are places on this earth that are so deep that the water in the, like the Mariana Trench off of the coast of Japan, it is so deep that if that crevasse were closed by, you know, uh, if there was a tectonic plate movements and it was squeezed shut, the water displaced would push up and it would cover the surface of most of the earth, even with the Himalayas. But if the Himalayas weren't there, it, you know, if it was flattened, because, you know, right now, India, the subcontinent, is pushing the plateau of Asia up. And, you know, you know, even 
again, this has to do with, you know, the scientists would say, oh, this is millions of years ago. But, um, you know, I, I think that it's not impossible to, to fi find scenarios. In fact, I, I have several um, books that talk about a thing called the, um, I don't remember the name of it. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a theory that uh, has to do with um, hydroplate theory. The hydroplate theory is the idea that when, the, when Noah's flood happened, that it was the movement of the tectonic plates sliding around because it says in Genesis that the water below the earth burst forth and it flooded the earth. So most of the earth was flooded by water below the plates. And those plates, as the water came out from underneath, they sank, but they started to slide. And then as they hit each other, that's when the mountains were built. Um, So that, that's another theory that I'm familiar with, but, um, but I actually feel that that theory doesn't, um, doesn't have as much uh, support as the hydroplate theories. But anyways, that, the whole idea is well, you know, whether it took millions of years or did this stuff happen quicker. And you know, the, the Bible doesn't, um, you know, doesn't give us all the answers of how the earth was created, but you know, to believe in a young earth is, for a lot of scientists is, is uh, basically rejecting the evidence, right? But as a believer, is it possible for a person who is a Christian and a believer and a scientist at the same time to be able to find evidence that may lead in the direction of the Bible? I think that the answer is yes, that if a person believes in God, but does not have to abandon science. I mean, God doesn't go against science uh, when it comes to, you know, things like gravity, right? You know, the Bible doesn't talk about people levitating or stuff like that. It does talk about, you know, Jesus doing miracles, creating something out of nothing. Um, you know, but God often uses physical means in order to carry out his will. I mean, when God sent Moses to the Pharaoh, when he told the people, told Pharaoh to let the people go, uh, what did he do to show that God was in control? Did he send, you know, did he have, you know, miraculous things happen that could never have happened? In some ways they were miraculous, but they were also natural, right? Frogs, you know, every year frogs would come out of the Nile. There just happened to be more, more frogs than they'd ever seen. You know, the Nile turning to blood, well, um, some people think that what it's talking about was a red algae bloom. And is that what it's talking about? Well, we're not absolutely sure. Um, you know, I guess you can claim that one is a pure miracle. Red algae bloom is toxic, that is poisonous. Yeah. And, well, so, some people think that's what it's talking about rather than, you know, the, the miracle of, it, of the water turning to blood. You know, but locusts and hail and all that stuff, those, all the ten plagues were uh, extraordinary examples of nature gone wild. But, you know, there are some miraculous things like, like the blood. And then the last two, obviously, the darkness that covers the earth. How in the world did darkness cover the earth for so long in that one section of the world? So we don't know. And um, so that would have been a miraculous thing because it couldn't have been a, a, uh, an eclipse, right? I mean, you, eclipses don't last for more than a few minutes. And then the final one, when the death of the oldest son. So we see God, you know, showing his, um, that he is in control of life and death and of, the, of nature. And when we try to figure out, well, why did some of those plagues happen? Well, the answer is that each plague of, uh, in 
This represents God, the God of Israel, attacking one of the specific gods of the Egyptians, right? And so the very last one is the God of uh, light, Ra, the sun god. And so when the darkness covers the earth, the uh, Egyptians believed that Ra was one of the most powerful gods. And all of a sudden, that god couldn't even do his work of bringing the sun. And the God of Israel was in control, so it showed that the God of Israel was attacking the gods of the Egyptians. And so they definitely, um, uh, uh, maybe some of those people came to faith. We have evidence of God's power over uh, nature and earth through uh, one of the uh, things for he was in the boat and they had to wake him up and he woke up and he, he, he uh, basically told him, you know, how little faith you have and he told the winds of the sea to be still and it was still. And then they said he even has control over yeah, so Jesus is, uh, you know, miracles over the control of nature shows that he's the, he is the God of the Bible, just as we see here, um, you know, the Bible where God is in control of nature. So in Psalm 24, you know, we see the opening lines of Genesis being described in the first two verses. Okay, how about verse 3? Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? So David is asking a rhetorical question. He starts out with a, uh, uh, two verses of praise, and now when he's asking this question, what is he talking about? Pure of heart. Okay. People. Yeah, he's talking about you know who is good enough, right? Who is good enough to be able to ascend? Now, what does it mean? In your translation, it said the hill of and so my translation, the NIV, says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, right? So what, what mountain are we talking about? Zion. Yeah, Mount Zion. And where is Mount Zion? Israel. Israel. Okay, most, most people don't think of it as a mountain. Where the temple is. Yes, Mount Zion is the highest point of the city of Jerusalem, which is where the temple was built. And then what they did is they chopped the top part of the hill off and then they put a, uh, a wall around it to create a kind of like a, a, a mount, right? Uh, they, they call it the Temple Mount because um, they put the walls up around the outside of the hill and then they chopped the top off and filled in the hill, you know, in, where the walls were so that they could create uh, a flat platform for the temple built. So Mount Zion is the point uh, the highest point of Jerusalem where they built the temple. When we talk about the mountain of the Lord, we're talking about God's um, you know, holy hill, the Mount Zion. And this is the place where uh, it was in the Old Testament in Genesis 22, it was called Mount Moriah. And what happened to Mount Moriah? Does anybody know? Abraham sacrificed, was going to sacrifice. That's right. Yeah, there we go. God Asked, uh, told he was testing uh, Abraham to sacrifice his uh, son Isaac there, and he was on that rock, and that rock became the place that they built the temple at, and that was the holy of holies was where the rock was, and that was, you know where the Jew, the um, the Muslims in the seventh century B.C. or A.D. when they took over Jerusalem, they built I think it was in the six eighties that they built the uh, dome of the rock on top of where the Holy of Holies was of the temple. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's the holy place. It's the place where they would offer the sacrificial, the blood of the lamb for the sins of the people. Psalm 2, 6, I have installed my king of Zion, my holy mountain. Yeah, so Psalm 2 is a, is a royal psalm. And so this one is has a similar connection because it was probably used in worship and the idea that the king is the one who um, carries out God's will uh, by ruling there. So the idea of who may ascend, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, it talks about how the priest, the high priest, had to sacrifice to make himself pure so he could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. Was he holy enough to go into the holy place? Yeah, one of the things that they did for the that high priest when we went into the holy of holies to offer the sacrifices is that they had to put a they put a rope around his ankle 
in case he got struck dead because nobody could go in there and get him, they would pull him back out. And that, it's kind of scary. But, I was going to say, I'd be afraid to go in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that, that's the true meaning of the fear of the Lord. You know, it's God is, it's not that God will strike you dead at any moment, but be in the holiness of God without any type of uh, reverence and awe is a dangerous thing. I mean, today, uh, a lot of Christians, they have lost the idea that God's uh, awesome glory uh, demands respect and awe. You know, we, we want to talk about Jesus as our buddy and our friend, and he is our friend, but he also is the Lord of all creation. All It says in John chapter 1, verse 14, all things were made through him. Nothing uh, was made, nothing exists that wasn't made by Jesus, right? So if Jesus is the creator of the universe with God the Father, we shouldn't just take it lightly. So this holy place is the place where the high priest would go, but it's really nobody has the right to stand before the Lord. His question is rhetorical, and he's asking it because the answer, of course, is no one. Okay, verse 4. Okay, well, that's an interesting translation. Okay, so the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. So he's answering his question. And is it pot, are there any humans that can do this? This is the interesting thing. Is it, he, he seems to believe that there is a person who could come into the Lord's presence. Clean hands and a pure heart. So what does clean hands represent? Yeah, well, we're talking about, you know, he uses these metaphors. Your hands and your heart are symbols for what? Your hands are a symbol of your actions. Love. Of your actions. Of your actions. Right, the things you can do. And then your heart is love. It's a symbol of your emotions or your feelings, right? So a person who comes before the Lord and is holy is a person whose actions are clean and pure and sinless, and their thoughts and their feelings are sinless and pure, right? So you have to have clean hands and a clean heart, your actions and your thoughts. Uh, and then he gets very specific. A person who doesn't trust or swear by false God. So that's the first and second commandments, right? You know, you shall, mm -hmm. you shall uh, not have any other gods, you know, and then some, uh, some Christian denominations include the explanation of the first commandment, you shall not make any graven images unto the Lord. As, and the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church and other churches like the Orthodox Church, that is the explanation of the first commandment. But some churches say the second commandment is you shall not make a graven image. Um, so, but then the, the second or the third commandment, do not uh, use the name of the Lord your God in vain. So swearing by a false god would be taking God's name in vain because it's not acknowledging the truth of who God is and it's putting another god in his place, right? So you're not necessarily using God's name falsely, but to use another god's name as if that were the true god, in essence, is breaking that second commandment as well. Now, Laura, when you read that, didn't it say something about a person's soul? Could you read that section again? Okay, so uh, a person who doesn't lift up their soul to an idol, what translation are you reading? Do you know? NIV. Oh, that's, oh, okay. That must be the NIV 1984 version because I'm looking at the 2011 version. Um, Mine's the new international version. I have something different. Right, okay. So the 2011 version, which is what I'm looking at on, uh, online right now, it just says, who does not trust in an idol. So That's what I have. The, um, the word in, uh, in Hebrew for self is the word nephesh, which is also is the word for soul. And so what happened is that uh, the, the older translation says, who does not lift their soul to the idol. It literally says, who does not themselves or himself look up to an idol. But because the word nephesh can mean soul as well, it... You know, when you're talking about your soul in Hebrew, you're talking about yourself. So that's why, uh, you know, a lot of translations now will just get rid of that word soul because it's not really intending to mean something. Uh, you know, I mean, how do you lift your soul up to an idol? 
Don't you just go to a temple and you bow down your body? So in the Hebrew, the idea of the difference between your body and your soul, they don't differentiate between those two things. They just, the word soul represents you, who you are. And so you could just say yourself. Um, uh, you make yourself an idol. There's nobody better than me out there. No, no. Uh, who, you know. No, no, no. I'm just trying to try when you, when I was just trying to understand that. Oh, because it, people, I'm thinking in Western society, our attitude is we don't answer to anybody. We're the boss. Well, yeah. In our culture, we are our own idols, right? That, that's what I was. Yeah, but I think that the translation is really saying who does not themself, who does not himself trust in an idol. That's what it means. Okay. And so, yeah, some trans, older translations translate the word nephesh as soul, when in fact it just means yourself. Um, My footnotes on, on four. <coughs> Swearing by what is false means telling lies under oath. How greatly God values honesty. Dishonesty comes easily, especially when complete truthfulness could cost us something, make us uncomfortable, or put us in an unfavorable light. Dishonest communication hinders relationships. Without honesty, a relationship with God is impossible. If we lie to others, we will begin to deceive others. God cannot hear us or speak to us. If we are building a wall of self-deception, you know, and a lot of times people tell lies so much of the time, they begin to believe their own lies. That's right. Yeah, so... It you know, um, Jeremiah, I can't remember which verse it is exactly, that says that the human heart is sinful above all things. And so we, we should recognize that, you know, that not only do we lie to God and we lie to others, but we lie to ourselves. Yeah. And so the human heart is not to be trusted. And if the Bible is making that acknowledgement, then how can uh, David even come to this conclusion that there is a person like this who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or fall uh, swear by a false god. You know, ha has there ever been a human who's ever done that? The Messiah. That's right. There we go. So, so David is writing through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's not just like, writing about a per uh, some perfect human being who could come before the Lord. He's talking about the one human who will do what all other humans were not able to do. So this is a messianic psalm. It is pointing ahead to the Messiah, Jesus, who is the only human who had pure hands and a pure heart. In Psalm 51, David also wrote that psalm, and he talks about how he was sinful from birth. He acknowledges our original sin condition as a human being. And, but he says in verse 10 of Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and re renew a steadfast spirit within me. So he's asking for God to do him what God requires. God requires perfection in order to come into his presence, and God gives what he requires, right? We cannot be holy by ourselves, but God requires us to be holy. So how can we come into God's presence? Through the holiness that is imputed upon us, given to us through the perfect Messiah who gives us his holiness. So even though David isn't really going into detail about, you know, how could, uh, how could a person have uh, clean hands and a pure heart. He, he's acknowledging this idea that that's the only way you can come into God's presence, but he's looking forward to a time when there will be the Messiah who will be able to do these things. And then a believer in that Messiah who saves us from our sin is the one who makes us able to be seen by God with clean hands and a pure heart. All right? So our sins are forgiven because of the one who could do what we couldn't do. And also paid for what we did. Okay, verse 5. Stan? Stan. Oh, Stan. Stan. Oh, Stan. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm, I'm reading, as I'm reading the NIV from 2011, and I, th I think Hebrew it's, it's singular. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from his Savior. But to make it more inclusive, uh, more, more, more and more modern translations are trying to make it plural. So they will receive. So it's just talking about people who are like this. But I think that the, because the original is using a singular, who is the he, he will be blessed? And who is the one who will be vindicated, vindicated by his Savior? 
Who's he talking about? Who would be the he in this in the original text? Messiah. Well, so the person who's being blessed is David, right? Or the believer, right? Because the the Messiah is the savior. So he's talking about uh, or the person who has a clean heart, hands and a pure heart. And he, he and it sounds like he's talking about, you know, any believer who is good enough to come into the Lord's presence. But then he acknowledges in verse 5 that that's not possible for any human being, but it's the person who, through faith, is going to receive these blessings from God, the blessings of forgiveness, and vindicated by their Savior. What it says in Genesis um, 15, verse 6, right? Uh, that's a very important verse in the Bible. Genesis 15, verse 6 is God's promise to Abraham. Does anybody remember what God, what did God promise to Abraham? Did he come king? No. He promised him a, a land. Uh, okay. He promised that his, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. I think he made three promises. I can't yeah, and then he uh, promised him uh, blessings, like of wealth and stuff like that. So a son, a land, and blessings. Okay, but, uh, but then it says that after God made these promises to him, this is 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed the Lord and God credited to him, credited it, his faith, to him as righteousness. So in essence, because of his faith in God, he was forgiven, accepted, and holy in the Lord's presence. And so that's how God works, is that God requires uh, holiness and he gives it to those who, through faith, allow God to take care of it, right? So that's what David is doing. He's saying, you know, um, in verse five, he, the person who believes, will receive blessings from Yahweh and vindication from God, their savior. So notice it talks about God, the creator, but he's also calling God the savior. So he's talking about God, the father, and God, the son. And of course, God, the Holy Spirit is at work in there as well. But so you can see he's acknowledging, you know, here a thousand years before Jesus even showed up, acknowledging that this is the way God works because that is the way God works. He doesn't tell us to be good to get to heaven. He tells us that you trust in me and, and confess your sins and you receive vindication from God, your Savior. Okay, verse 6. So, yeah. um, such is the generation of those who speak him, seek him who seek your face, God of Jacob. So, now, Pastor, on mine, uh, across the side of it, <coughs> S E L A H, what is that? Selah? Selah? Yeah, Selah is a, uh, uh, is, um, a musical uh, notation in Hebrew that we don't know what the meaning is. Oh. Most likely, it, it refers to an uh, interlude, a musical interlude, because these would have been chanted. So that when this was sung in the temple for worship, when you get to the word Selah, that means, you know, okay, you had somebody singing the chorus, and now we're having a musical interlude. And so, you know, you just meditate while the music is going on. So that is not necessarily part of the text itself. It's something that is an aside. So some, translate, some Bibles will put it way to the right and show that it's just, um, it's yeah, not, it's way to the right. yeah, because it's a musical interlude. It's not part of the meaning of the text. Oh, okay. Okay, so here it's talking about such is the generation who seeks him. So the generation, we're talking about people who, who are alive at the time of the writer. And this is true for every generation. See, I don't know if you've heard the expression that God has no grandchildren. That means that you cannot be saved because your parents believe in God, right? So the Israelites, when they escaped from Egypt, they died in the wilderness because they wandered for 40 years. And then their children, when they got ready to go into the promised land, in the book of Deuteronomy, before Moses dies, he tells the people, God did all these things for you. And he gives them the Ten Commandments again. And he says, you know, will you, uh, will you uh, pledge your uh, faithfulness to the Lord? And they all had to say yes. I mean, I guess they could have said no, but... The whole point was, you know, you don't get to go to the promised land under the promise that God made to your parents. God is making a new covenant with you. Each person has to have their own relationship with God. So the generation of those who seek him are the ones who will be vindicated. Those who have faith in, in God and also God's promise of a Messiah uh, are the ones who will be saved. Uh, go ahead. So uh, am, I, am I understanding this right? 
the he in verse 4 is the Messiah, but the he in verse 5 is the believer. Okay, so is, in the verse 4, it just doesn't say the word he, I don't think. It says the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. So I would say that that could be, it could be either the believer through faith who were forgiven and our hands are clean and our hearts are clean because of forgiveness. But it's also ultimately true in Jesus, right? So Jesus, the Messiah, is the only one who is a human being had pure actions and pure intentions. But then in verse 5, um, the he is talking about the believer. Yeah, because it's talking about you know, the one who receives blessings from the Lord. All right, thank you. And then verse 6, because it's talking about such as the generation who, who seek. The word him there is referring to God or, or the Savior, because that's what it said in the verse before it. <clears throat> and then notice that it parallels that first sentence of verse 6 with the second half of it, which says, who seeks your who seek your face, God of Jacob? So it's using the expression for God as the God of Jacob, just in case you know a person in the ancient world misunderstood which God we're talking about, right? Oh. You know, you know there was, because the word Lord in Hebrew there there was a word for Lord that was used in, in the Semitic cultures, and it's the word Baal. Baal is the name of the God of the Canaanites, but it's also the word for Lord or Master. So there are places in the Bible where the Hebrew people actually use the word Baal to refer to God, right? The first, one of the first person was Jer Jeroboam the first, who after the split, after Saul and Rehoboam split the kingdom, you know, the, two the two nations in the south split away from, and the 10 nations in the north split, and they started following a different king, which was Jeroboam the first. And Jeroboam the first didn't want anybody going across his border to the temple in Judah. So he created his own temple, created a golden calf, and he told his people, behold, your God. And so the people would go to the temple. Uh, he had two of them, one in Bethel, which was a, just across the border from Jerusalem. And the other one was by the Sea of Galilee, which was in Dan. And so he had two temples with these golden calves. And so he said that the people should worship the Lord, but the word for Lord that he used was the word Baal, right? And so at the time, the word Baal could mean Lord or master, but it also was the name of the God of the Canaanites. And so what happened is they, they he was muddying the waters. That's he was, say, that's confusing it is, at that time. yeah, well, at the, see at the time, it just kind of like said, oh, sure, we believe in, in the Lord and we believe in Baal, but it's called syncretism when you start mixing the two cultures. He mixed the worship of Baal with the worship of Yahweh in order to control the religious, uh, the, the religion of the time. And what happened is he led the people astray into full idol worship so that they were destroyed in 722 by the Assyrians as punishment for their sins. The southern kingdom didn't worship Baal all the time, but they often did. There was times where they worshiped Baal and worshiped other gods but then there were some good kings as well, like um, Hezekiah during the time of Isaiah, and then during the time of Jeremiah, there was Josiah, and those were the two good kings after David over the you know couple hundred year period that kept Judah from being destroyed earlier. You had a question? No, no. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, using this phrase, the God of Jacob, just is back to uh, you know how the Book of Genesis, um, it God. You know, rest, the angel wrestled with Jacob and changed his name to Israel, right? And so Israel is the name of the country that they live in, but it's also the name of, of Jacob, whose name was changed. And Israel means struggles with God and perseveres. It, it implies the person struggles with God and, and overcomes, overcomes their difficulties because God is with them now. So it's not like you're fighting against God so much, but you're like submitting to God. When Jacob was wrestling with the angel of the Lord who when the angel spoke it said it spoke with the words of the Lord so who is the angel of the Lord who speaks for God that would be the second person of the Trinity right so God in the flesh who were, wrestled with Jacob in essence we're talking about the pre-incarnate Christ Jesus uh, and so because uh, he's acknowledging the the roots of their faith it goes all the way back to Abraham Isaac and Jacob but you know, here he's describing Jacob because of the name Jacob is the foundation for the name of the country, which was changed to Israel. 
Okay, verse 7. Lift your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Amen. Amen. That's right. So, so it talk, the first couple of verses talks about praise. The second co uh, couple of verses talks about, um, you know, about who is worthy. And the th fifth and sixth verse are acknowledging that the one who is worthy is the one who has faith. And it, it gets into this thing about um, praising the God who is the very one who saves us. And, and so th these verses, not only are they used in, in Christian uh, liturgy during uh, the time of Advent, but there's another time. What day of the year is this sometimes read? Think about when the King of Glory entered into the gates of the city of Jerusalem on a donkey with palm branches waving. <laughs> Come on, you guys. A little more, a little more. I can't figure it out. Okay. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Right. So the week before Jesus was crucified, he entered into the gates of Jerusalem. And this verse was probably in the minds of the people of Israel. It was a, it is a beautiful example of how Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. Because he's the king of glory. He entered into the gates of Jerusalem. And they lifted up their, uh, the heads of the, you know, the gates are opened. The people are waving palm branches. And then verse 8, it asks the question. And again, this is rhetorical, but it's, the answer is obvious. Um, Marcus, do you want to read verse 8? Uh, next one? Yeah. Okay. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. So you know when it uses this idea of who is the King of Glory, you know who, David is the King of of Israel, but he's acknowledging that he's not the only King. In fact, he's just a a King who is appointed by the true King. So the King of Glory is, and it uses the word Lord, but notice it's all in capitals. So when the word Lord is in all in capitals in English, that means that it, it's the word Yahweh, which is the name of God. So who is the king of glory? It is Yahweh, and it tells us he is strong and mighty. He's mighty in battle. Now, those four strong, mighty, well, and then mighty in battle is kind of the same thing, right? Uh, that gives us some images of what? In the Old Testament, when do we see God, Yahweh, strong and mighty and battling things? We might say, well, you know, we don't know, does God battle? Well, he battles by sending his people into battle or battle the forces of evil. So what picture comes to mind when we talk about God, Yahweh, being strong and mighty and battling? I think about Joshua and the angel that showed up Joshua, was it Jericho, I think? That's right. Before, on his way to Jericho, in Joshua chapter 5, the angel of, the, of God's army, the leader of God's army, is called the, the Lord of Sabaoth, which means the Lord of hosts. That's right. And so that's a, a, the book of Joshua is a good picture of God battling for his people against the Canaanites and bringing, giving Jericho into the hands of the, those people. But I'm thinking of even further back. No, not that far. Not okay. that far back. <laughs> not that far back. <laughs> no, I was thinking okay, of uh, being uh, with Moses, uh, doing battle with the Egyptians. There we go. Freeing his people. The Exodus. I think that this is a reference to the Exodus because over again in the book of Exodus, it tells us that God is strong and mighty, and He was fighting against the gods of the Egyptians. He fought against Pharaoh. Pharaoh's army was pursuing the people of Israel. And notice how the, the strength, it says, through the strength of his hands, it says in uh, Exodus, he moved the waters. God parted the waters so that Israel could go through on dry land. But when the, what kept the, um, the army of Pharaoh from being able to overtake? Because, you know, people on chariots can definitely go faster than a bunch of people on foot. Yeah, that's right. It was the pillar of fire by day and the pillar of cloud, or pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. But here, you know, it says in Genesis, uh, yeah, in Exodus, it tells us about how that pillar of fire separated them so Pharaoh's army couldn't attack them. But once they got through, then the waters collapsed, and and that was God's battle. He was wiping out Pharaoh's army, and you know, in that section right afterwards, it tell, tells us how Miriam, they, uh, Moses's sister, sings a song of praise that God, uh, in his battle against Pharaoh's army, destroyed them, you know, and they were floating, and their bodies were floating, and, it, and it's pretty graphic. Yeah. Archaeologists have found uh, chariots in that sea. That's right, yeah, archaeologists have found, uh, you know, like I said, gold 
chariots covered with you know with um, coral and stuff like that in an area that is most likely the the true um, place where they would have uh, crossed over on the Red Sea. That means that the real Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia and not in Egypt at the tip of Mount of the Sinai Peninsula. Marcus, I don't, it reminds me of the Battle of Armageddon, also the description of the uh, of the battle in, in chapter nineteen. I think. Okay, so yeah, the Battle of Armageddon in the book of Gen uh, Revelation, and the word Armageddon it comes from the Hebrew word uh, Arm, then Megiddo. It means the Valley of Megiddo. So Armageddon is the Valley of Megiddo, the Jezreel Valley, where a lot of uh, battles occurred, a lot of bloody battles. And so that is something like the, back in Ezekiel and some of the other prophets. But David is writing this a thousand years before Jesus' time. So... Um, most likely he can't be referring to the kinds of uh, the final apocalyptic battle because uh, you know this would have been predated uh, prophets and and uh, the book of revelation but i don't see any reason why we couldn't apply god battling the forces of evil when jesus returns to that as well because god it is true that god is still strong and mighty and he still will overcome our enemies but on the cross, that's where Jesus would have overcome the greatest enemies. The mightiest battle of all was he, through his own death, he conquered death. And uh, he destroyed sin, death, and the power of the devil. Okay, last couple of questions. Let's see. Sandra, do you want to read verse 9? Uh, 9, right? Yep. Okay. Um, lift up your hands, O ye gates, even lift them up. The everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Okay, so we just heard that, didn't we? In verse, mm -hmm. that was from verse 7. So notice, because it's repeated, that it is kind of like a chorus. So the, Jew, the people of Israel, as they would have sung this, they probably would have sung this, these verses. In fact, I think verse 10 is also a copy, is copied as well, right? So, um, uh, so 7 and 8 are repeated in verse 9 and 10. So is there anything different between 7 and 8 and 9 and 10? If you look at them closely, can you see any differences in the text? Because I think that verse 9 is an exact copy of verse 7, right? And then in verse 8, who is the king of glory? And then in verse 10, it's slightly different. It says, who is he, this king of glory? And verse 8 says, the Lord strong and mighty. But this one says, the Lord Almighty is the King of glory. So uh, verses 7 and 8 are the chorus. And, and 9 and 10 are the re repetition of the chorus of this psalm. But in Hebrew, when you change a pattern, then the change of the pattern becomes the emphasis of the poetry. So if you look at verses 7 through 8 and 9 and 10, everything is exactly the same until you get to the very last line, isn't it? Right, the very last line. And so verse 10 says, Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Yeah. Back here on the, uh, verse 7, I go back to Isaiah 26, 2. A song of praise that refers back to this one also. Right, so Isaiah is, re is referring to this, um, uh, to this psalm because David wrote it first. Isaiah 26. 26. Okay. So let's see. I'm looking at that up, looking that up online. Um, yeah. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter the nation that keeps faith. So the idea of going through the gates of righteousness is actually a metaphor for going into where? What city has righteous gates that will be opened for those who are or pure of hand and pure of heart? Heaven. That's right. The New Jerusalem. That's right. So, so um, Isaiah is picturing the, the 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 heavenly city of Jerusalem using the ideas that David first introduced in his Psalm Psalm 24. So this idea of the gates. So it sounds like he's talking about the gates of the city of Jerusalem, but most likely he's talking about the the true fulfillment of this, which is in the the gates of the city of the New Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. Because that's the only place where, I mean, God rules in heaven. And, you know, he rules on earth, but not everywhere on earth. We might say, well, how can God not rule everywhere on earth? 
It's because God's rule is where, his, uh, in, where he has the influence over the person's life. And so that's in the hearts of believers. So people who do not believe in God are not under God's rule. Not because God can't do what he wants, but because God's not going to violate their decision. If a person rejects God, he's not going to force them to love him, and he doesn't rule over them. And it says in, I think it's John chapter 8, where the, uh, where the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus about, he, they say, oh, children of Abraham. And he says, no, you're not. And, he's, and, he, and then who does Jesus say that the Pharisees are the children of? The devil himself. That's right. He, he says, you are the children of your father, who is the, who is a, he's been a liar from the beginning. Let me see if I can find that. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, John chapter 8, in verse 42, Jesus says to the Pharisees, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come from God. And then he goes on to say, um, he says in verse 44, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. He is the father, the liar, and the father of lies. So he's talking, telling the Pharisees that they're really the children of the devil because they reject Jesus and they reject God's prophecy about Jesus. Uh, and so, for us to be the children of God is um, is through the gift of faith. And then, the, when the question is asked in eight and verse ten of Psalm twenty-four, "Who is the King of Glory?" the only person who can answer the 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 question correctly is the person who has faith. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, we acknowledge, as it says in verse 10, the Lord, that is Yahweh Almighty, he is the king of glory. And so he, this uh, psalm ends with this uh, uh, amazing statement of faith. It's a proclamation of the truth of what creation was made for. Creation was created so that it may acknowledge its creator. Whereas the rest of creation can do that because, you know, nature does what God created it to do. Humans are the only part of creation that doesn't do what we're created to do, uh, along with the, the demons, I guess, because yeah. they rejected God and were cast out of heaven. But humans were created to be in relationship with God, and we, we rebelled, and our sin has been passed down. But we are reborn through faith in Jesus Christ and, th and through baptism, right? So those two things go hand in hand. If you're an adult, you're, you believe, and then you're baptized. If you're a child, you can be baptized, and you should be raised to believe. And, you know, whether or not it's, you're, you're baptized as a baby or as an adult, the whole point is that um, it is God who does the creation, the new, the new birth, right? Um, and, you know, Jesus even asked the Pharisees, he says, whose baptism was John's baptism from? Was it from God or was it from man? And remember, they didn't want to answer it because they were afraid that if they said it was from John, the people would be angry at the Pharisees for not believing in John. If they said, said it was from God, they would say, why didn't you believe in Jesus then? So, but the answer was clear. Whose baptism is John's baptism from? God. From humans or from God? God. It's from God. And jo John baptized uh, a baptism of repentance, and the, the disciples baptized in the same way, but in the name of Jesus. So they, baptized, they, they called people to repentance, and, but they baptized them and said, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So through baptism, our, our sins are washed clean. And so uh, even a child can receive that because it is faith that is given as a gift. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that a person who's baptized as a baby will necessarily be saved because they could reject it when they're older. You know, unfortunately, I do know people who were baptized as babies that never never came to believe in Jesus, partly because maybe their parents didn't raise them as a child, or maybe they got older and they rebelled against it, or, and that's very sad. So, but, Pastor, in your opinion, is it better to wait until they're... No, it's not better to wait. It's better to... I mean, you don't do that with anything else in life. It's not, as you don't tell your children, when you decide you want to go to school, you can go to school. Right. Or, you know, if you decide that you want to try drugs or not try drugs, no. that's... Okay. No, no, we tell our children, don't do this. Don't try drugs because it's bad for you. And you have to go to school because it's good for you. We just do those things. And so it's the same thing is true about faith. And that's more important than anything. So we should baptize our children, raise them in the faith, be good examples. You know, if you send your child to church and you don't go to church yourself, you're already giving a bad example. 
but you know, by doing what's right, our children will come to the point where they will have to make their own statement of faith. And they'll do that whether or not they think they're doing it. Their choice is either they believe in God or they don't believe in God. You know, and sometimes a person can run away from God for a long time and still come back. Praise the Lord. But if they don't come back, then, you know, God doesn't give up on them until the point comes where, you know, you die. Because it, uh, everybody has a chance to be saved until, the, until their life is over. And then, you know, then you meet your maker. Then you stand before the throne. And then you'll be judged according to whether or not you believed or not, didn't believe. And so this, uh, Dave, uh, David is, is giving a statement of faith and he's inviting us to make that sta same statement of faith. God, Yahweh, the Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. And we can do, praise God and we should praise God not only with our lips and our hearts, but with our actions and our lives as well. Any final questions? I like doing the songs. I'll be happy to do the book, but I like doing the songs. Yeah. Okay, well, well, there's lots of psalms to go for in the future, so if we need to take a break, we'll, we'll do psalms in the future as well. But uh, good study, and uh, next week we'll start the Book of Acts.